Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jack Ames. I'm the founder and director of Defend Life. We're a grassroots pro-life organization, and we're going to do something today that nobody in the pro-life movement, and as far as I know, nobody in the, the patriotic movement or anybody in the Tea uh, Party movement has ever done. We're going to go around to 10 of our historic sites, and we have Ambassador Alan Keyes with us, and he's going to talk about the significance of those sites and for about 10 minutes or so. Some of the sites we'll be going to are the National Archives, the Washington Monument, the Jefferson Memorial, the Holocaust Museum, the Vietnam Memorial, and many other important monuments. But now I'd like to introduce one of the greatest guests of the pro-life movement, Ambassador Alan Keyes. Thank you, Jack. I'm very pleased to be part of an effort here today, uh, not only to understand uh, in terms of the basic premises and principles what the pro-life movement is about, but how deeply ingrained those principles are uh, in the culture of the United States. So in fact, when we are fighting uh, to vindicate the right to life, we are in fact fighting to vindicate the American way of life, uh, which is seriously in crisis, seriously under threat. Uh, and I think that uh, the very same causes that contribute uh, to the death of millions uh, of children in the womb are the causes that are now contributing uh, to the death of America as a free country. Uh, and we'll be exploring uh, both what made that freedom possible and why the abandonment of the basic premises of God-given rights, such as uh, is exemplified uh, in this whole pro-abortion effort, uh, is now dooming this country if we don't turn it around. Thank you so much, Alan. Now everybody can board, please. of the great documents of this nation's founding, among other things, uh, the U.S. Constitution, and the document that stated the premises and principles it's based on, the Declaration of Independence. It's fitting, it's actually necessary, in fact, for us to begin uh, at the repository of the great documents uh, that marked the founding of our country. More than any other country in the history of the world, America is, in fact, defined as a nation by the ideas that are set forth in those documents, especially the Declaration of Independence. And I think it's vitally important right now for Americans to remember that when the Constitution was put together, the rubric that defined the acceptability of suggestions and provisions in the Constitution during the course of the Constitutional Convention was, as Madison put it in Federalist 39, I think, he, he pointed out that at the Convention, their rubric for decision was whether or not what they were going to adopt was consistent with the principles for which they had fought during the Revolution. And where are those principles stated? It's not as if, in America, those principles are lost in time or we have some difficulty knowing what they're about. Uh, we are a country in which those principles will, were set forth in what amounted at, at that time, though we don't think of it this way, but it, it really was. It amounted to a press release. The document that we revere as the Declaration of Independence uh, was not, in fact, the action by which the people of the United States declared their independence. That action, the resolution by which they declared these states are and of right ought to be free, was adopted on July 2nd. The Declaration of Independence was a document for release to the public, uh, announcing what had been done and presenting in a pithy way the justification for it. And when I say justification, we need to think of that literally. What the Declaration is talking about is, in fact, what makes it just for them to do what they're doing. 
and, and we live in an age I know when very often yeah. folks are going to war and killing each other and we say that it's because of their economic interests and because of this and that and the other thing. The founders actually didn't believe that. They didn't believe that just because you were upset about something, you should go around killing people or risking the lives of your own uh, uh, children and family. They thought that that had to be justified in terms of a moral understanding, justified quite literally in a way that God would understand. And that's exactly the rationale that is then presented in the Declaration of Independence. So when they refer to the principles for the sake of which they fought the revolution, they're referring, in fact, to the very first principle that is mentioned in the Declaration, and mentioned a couple of times right at the beginning. Because when they say at the very beginning in the, in the first part of the Declaration uh, that they have to set forth the causes that lead them to separate from Great Britain, uh, they, they say that uh, it is done in terms of the laws of nature and of nature's God. That these states are and of right ought to be free and independent states. And then the very first premise of justice that they set forth in the great statement that has rung down through history. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And that's not an incidental statement. That's a profoundly, deeply important statement because everything else that they say follows from it. And it also is important because it provides the basis for the concept that has become and still remains vital to our discourse with one another when we're talking about the most fundamental issues in our political affairs. There's almost no discussion we have in this country that does not boil down in some way or other to a discussion of rights. Now, what we lose sight of, though, these days is the inherent meaning of that word. So that every time we say rights, what are we referring to? These days, a lot of folks will try to get people to believe that a right is a freedom. See? And right is therefore all about freedom. But I think you step back for a minute and you realize something really important. Yeah, it is true that every right involves an exercise of freedom. But it's also true that every exercise of freedom is not an exercise of right. Why is that? Well, it's quite obvious. Because sometimes you choose to do what's wrong. And if you choose to do what's wrong, you're not in the right. You don't have the right when you do it. And so what the founders had to do in the very first place was to set down the rubric, the standard, the authority that does what? That allows you to distinguish rights from wrongs. Right from wrong. And what is that authority? Right? What is it that allows you to do that? I remember years ago, talking to a young lady. It was uh, in the context of the New Hampshire primaries at a function that they were having, and she was interviewing me uh, on behalf of her school newspaper. And we got into a back and forth because she asked me why it is that I always talked about the Declaration and unalienable rights. And in the course of the discussion, I remember looking at her and, and asking her, well, where did they teach you that our rights come from? And she gave me the answer that is often and usually given these days uh, by the folks who want to act as if the Constitution <coughs> is the source of our rights. They tell these poor kids that our rights come from the Bill of Rights. And so I looked back at her and I said, well, wait a minute. The folks in that first Congress, when they were putting together the uh, Bill of Rights, uh, it hadn't been written yet. So they couldn't have gotten the rights that are put in the Bill of Rights from the Bill of Rights because they were writing it. So how did the people who wrote the Bill of Rights recognize and put in that Bill of Rights, the rights that we now take for granted. And of course, you couldn't give me an answer. But the Declaration actually help us, helps us to think through that answer. And it's actually very simple, because the Declaration says it quite clearly, our rights come from the hand of the Creator. 
the one whose authority determined the laws of nature, for he is nature's God. And the end result of that is also very simple. Because if at the end of the day your rights come from the hand of God, then the standard of right is the authority of God. And remaining in the right in terms of that authority is what allows you, in fact, to assert a right. So, if that is the case, and you want to find out what your rights are, what do you do? You do what the founders did, what many of the philosophers did, whom they read. You have to start by looking at what are the laws of our nature. The things that God set down to make us what we are. To set the boundaries that distinguish us from trees and plants and stones and other animals that make us distinctly human and that preserve us in our humanity. Among those first laws of nature was the, the law that said that this gift of life has to be respected and that you therefore will do everything in your power to preserve your own and when it comes not into conflict with your own, to preserve the lives of others. That is the basic tenet on which this nation was founded. And it leads to an insight as to what is the great crisis that we are now in. For we are now in a crisis where many are saying that we can sustain our rights, that we can keep our liberty, that we can understand self-government without reference to the rule and authority of God. And when they make that statement, they in fact are saying something so profoundly incompatible with our survival that as we walk down that road, we are perishing. And that's why I think it's important for people to come to this uh, great repository of, the, of that wisdom and not only look at the words, but face the challenge that is foremost in those words. And that challenge is to receive and acknowledge as our founders did this great truth that we are free when we follow and obey the authority of God. And that in so far as we do so, and have the right to do so, we secure those unalienable rights which come from his hand. Beautiful. We're standing in front of the Washington Monument. It's the building in the central part of Washington that above all symbolizes the important role that Washington played in the founding of our country. I think that role can be summed up in one word that all of his contemporaries would have recognized and would have applied to him. And that word is character. George Washington was the example of good character that in fact was held up and held in the hearts and minds of all of his contemporaries. The great influence he had in the course of the American Revolution uh, was not simply on account of his wealth. I know that's an easy assumption for everybody to make these days, but it would not have held the allegiance and loyalty of people who knew that every last thing they owned was being put on the line for the sake of the battle in which they were engaged against the British. You don't simply follow the counsels of the wealthy when you know that each and every one of you may end up hanging from a gibbet deprived of all wealth and all station and all power. So what was it that would have given them the trust and confidence, a trust and confidence, by the way, that extended to his military command in the dark days of the revolution when it seemed as if uh, there was no hope for the revolutionary cause on the battlefield, that extended to the politics of the revolution when there was great division over whether or not the army could be funded, on whether or not the corruption that characterized some of that funding process was going to be dealt with. But they, they had arguments, they had discussions, but no one lost faith in George Washington because of his character. It was the kind of character that when he walked into a room, everybody was on their best behavior. And they wrote this in their letters to one another all the time. This was the sort of fellow you didn't swear, you didn't curse, you didn't tell your usual body stories, not when George Washington was around. Because he exemplified the best that was to be expected in the social interactions of human beings one with another. That was the idea they had in mind. But it also has a great significance in terms of the role that he played, I believe, in the adoption of the Constitution.
we have to ask ourselves sometimes, especially when we look at what is going on in our own day. We look now at an elite, if I can call them that, the outstanding people, the people who have been greatly successful and who therefore have somehow exemplified for us what can be accomplished in art and science and business. They will have the great talent, the great wealth, the great shows. This elite, these outstanding people today, are, are people who very often are pretty much preoccupied with their own business and with their own satisfaction. And they more and more are turning us in a direction that hands power to our elites so that they can decide for us what our attitudes will be and what our paths will be. That was the way of the world when this nation was founded. Everywhere on earth practically and certainly everywhere in the context of that European civilization that this country first mostly came out of, that was the rule. It was called aristocracy, oligarchy. The people were called the gentry and the nobles, and they ruled. They ruled, it was said, by a kind of divine right because of the occult properties of the blood, a kind of inherited stamp of approval from God himself. What's interesting is that though it would have served their turn, that though they would have ended up being the nobles and the aristocrats of the day, and Washington surely would have ended up uh, as one of those human beings blessed or cursed in the history of the world to found a dynasty. For if there had been a king, he would surely have been the first king of the United States and his family would have been the family in which that line was to be drawn if it was drawn on a hereditary basis. Why do we never stop and ask ourselves, why did folks who could have ended up as kings and dukes and nobles ruling over vast tracts of land undreamt of in European terms and they knew it because these were the dreams of many of the Tories who served the British king and who said that when they defeated these rebels they were going to get that, that kind of prize. But the people who fought for the revolution fought for it on a basis that actually rejected that kind of government. They established a, a government that I think was rightly described by Lincoln as of, by, and for the people. And whatever the historians want to say about how uh, much the franchise was or was not extended to this group or that, the basic principle on which they fought made it in principle right to extend that participation to every single person in the society but on a special basis that was also exemplified by George Washington. Because character was not only important in getting the job done during the Revolution. If you read the writings of the founders, character was the most important ingredient that they saw in making it possible for a way of life based on self-government, based on the participation of the people in decisions. They all of them said it and wrote it and lived by it, that there was no way that a government based on representation where people were chosen by election to be the governors and be the legislatures by the people themselves so that ultimately the sovereignty was not in the hands of a potentate, not in the hands of a little clique of rulers, but in the hands of the people at large. Right? But what was the indispensable need if that was to work? It was the virtuous character of the people. And Washington was one of the models of those virtues, including a virtue of magnanimity that understood that nobility is not defined in terms of how much money you've gotten, how much land you have, and how much success you achieve. At the end of the day, it must be defined in terms of your willingness to make a contribution even at the risk of all of that, including your life, that will sustain justice and right for the society in which you live. That was the other side of the concept of rights. And it leads to a conclusion, by the way, that I think is right there in the Declaration. But sometimes we miss it. See, because uh, a famous part of the Declaration says that the purpose of government is to secure the rights that come to us from God. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And you know, it took me many years before it struck me at one point uh, what 
that phrase actually refers to. And it didn't occur to me until I had pondered it, stepped back for a moment and said, wait a minute, all these years I've thought of that as consent of the people who will be governed by the government that's being established, right? But no, it can't quite be true. Because the consent which establishes that government comes before the government has been established. So in giving that consent, they are not governed by it. You see what I'm saying? That phrase, consent of the governed, at the moment when that occurs, the government that's referred to can't be the government that they're establishing. What is it, though? Well, I think it's quite obvious. Christ said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. What is a kingdom? Kingdom is a place where the king's writ runs, where the king's law rules. What rule was evoked in the Declaration of Independence that governs all human beings? It was the rule which was called by the founders the laws of nature and of nature's God, and from whence they derived their understanding of right. Who are the governed then? The governed are those who stand together in their mutual consent to be governed by the laws of God, by God's standard of righteousness and right. And this is profoundly important, you see, because it means that when we talk about government and how government's supposed to be justice for everybody, yeah, it's supposed to be justice for all. It's not injustice for anybody. And so those who decide that they will stand against the right are not the governed. And they have withdrawn their consent from the basic compact on which all constitutions and governments are based. And I think Washington exemplified the simple and profound necessity at the helm, but also in the hearts of the people, for respect for the virtues and character that come from living out our respect for Almighty God in the way that we deal with ourselves and the way that we deal with one another and therefore in the way that as a people we will deal with the challenge of being the sovereign people of the United States. Amen. We are here at, at, uh, in front of the Jefferson Memorial. Now Jefferson is, as you know, famous as the person who penned the original draft of the Declaration of Independence. It's important to note that he was very important in putting a lot of those words together, though some of them, as some of you may know, were words that he had encountered in the course of his reading of the great philosophers that helped to contribute to the thinking that then informed the judgment of our uh, founders and the framers of the Constitution when they were articulating uh, the causes that led them to declare independence, to fight in the Revolutionary War, and then to put together the Constitution. One of those causes, obviously, and one that was uppermost in the minds of the founding generation, uh, and which sadly, I would say tragically, ought to be uh, in, in the uppermost part of our minds, but is it's summarized by one word, and that word is included in the inscription that's around the rotunda of this great monument. Uh, an inscription which, as uh, I recall, if I recall correctly, I may be wrong in a word or two, but uh, it's a famous quote from Jefferson uh, in which he says, I swear eternal enmity against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. And it's interesting in a number of respects, because that word tyranny is the focus. Now, what is tyranny? Well, tyranny, to put not too fine a point on it, is lawless government. It is government that acknowledges no law, but the arbitrary whim or will of the sovereign, whoever that may be. And, and by the way, the sovereign doesn't have to be one person. The sovereign can be one person, a few people. It can even be a majority of the people who, in disregard of right and justice, impose their will by human laws that have no regard for the laws of nature and of nature's God, that have no regard, therefore, for justice. And it was not just Jefferson. That animus against tyranny was what drove the American Revolution. And unlike our day, 
The founders weren't thinking of tyranny in terms of the terrible spectacle that resulted from the unbridled tyrannies of the 20th century. In some ways, that century has done us a great disservice because I actually talk to people in our country who think that you're not looking at tyranny unless the, the blood is running in the streets, unless the folks are being killed in the ovens by the millions, unless you are dealing with the most brutal aspects of tyranny that claimed people's lives by the millions in the 20th century. The founders had never witnessed any such thing. They, they, they did have witness and memory of some pretty terrible conflicts in the course of the religious wars uh, that had preceded the founding in Europe. But to them, tyranny was something that had to do with the way that laws were made. And they understood that the tyrannical results, the brutal uh, results, the crushing out of life, the stealing of land, the destruction of on a large scale, that that was something that actually began inside. And that's the other part of Jefferson's famous quote, isn't it? Over the mind, he says. Why? Because he understands tyranny doesn't begin out here. It begins in here. And for folks who think that the founders weren't influenced by Christianity and all, who else said that? Oh, Jesus said that. Jesus said that. Remember, Jesus was uh, said that that the evil deeds and injustice and iniquity, all of the sins, they don't begin outside. They begin. They well up from the heart. They come out of the heart. And the heart, in the biblical terms, includes the mind. Right? When the Bible refers to the heart, it's including mind and spirit, as well as will. All of that makes up the heart. So, and, and what Jefferson is acknowledging is that that's where tyranny begins. And that means it's related to the monument we were just at. Because tyranny has first to begin in the breakdown of character. It has then to begin in the breakdown of understanding as people begin to see the lesser manifestations of that breakdown of character and don't react. And I fear that's what we've been doing. Uh, we have been seeing a breakdown in the character, our own and that of the individuals whom we have lifted to power. But because the, we don't see the terrible things that went on in the 20th century, I have so many people say to me, well, you can't say that that's happened and it's so terrible because, and usually that because is followed by the fact that we're not getting knocks on the door in the night yet and hauled off to prisons and so forth. But all the apparatus is being put in place. And what Jefferson understood, and it's why, he swore eternal enmity. That means every time I see it, I will resist it. I will be the enemy of tyranny over the mind. Because if you can shackle the mind, then you will easily shackle the people themselves. And they will not be free. Because once those chains of the mind are fastened, they are the hardest to shake off. They are the hardest to break. It is those chains that for all the centuries of human existence before this country was founded led great masses of people to stand before their masters so awed, so cowed, that they would not even lift their eyes to look into the eyes of those who were supposed to be the noble rulers of their society. It's one of those things I love about being an American. Exemplified, if I may say so, by episodes that occurred at the beginning of uh, the present and contemporary administration in this country when Barack Obama was going around bowing to people. Remember this? He was bowing to the Japanese emperor and bowing to the Saudi king and so forth. And it brought to my mind, and I looked it up and verified it, the fact that when the U.S. Olympic team participated in the Olympics that took place in, in Belgium where they had a king at the time, our team was the only team that did not stand before the royal box and go into a deep bow. Why? Because Americans at that time still believed that Americans did not bow before any human power. They bowed to God. And they bowed to the rules and laws of God that governed in their hearts. And therefore what? Their minds are free. Their minds are free. Because it is the freedom that comes from a righteous understanding of what you do. That freedom that comes from a good conscience that allowed Americans to stand tall precisely because they were willing to humble themselves before the rules that made it possible for people to live together in decency and peace.
And that's why I think this monument is a, a, a great tribute, not just to the fact that Jefferson played an important role, but to the fact that the role he played exemplified the wisdom of our founders. It was the reason, by the way, that some of the historians will tell you the American Revolution didn't take place because the taxation that they were being exposed to was so onerous that it was driving them out of business and all of this stuff that some people try to get you to believe when they're selling the tax issue these days. That's not true. A matter of fact, the British put it together rather skillfully. When they imposed those new taxes, they actually imposed them so that they would be lower than the taxes that had prevailed before. They thought they would seduce Americans into accepting the bad way that it was done without regard for their legislatures because they were actually going to make money on the deal. But the Americans of that time seemed to uh, be different than what our politicians say these days. They weren't looking at their wallets and their pocketbooks. They were looking at their rights. They were looking at their obligations. They were looking at what God expected them to be if they were going to have a society that was going to be a decent society that respected his rule. And what he expected them to be was people who would stand before him and his law and not be willing to accept laws that contravened his will. And so long before any terrible consequences came upon them, even if the economic benefits were going to be in their favor, they rejected the taxes that the British were imposing because they were taxes imposed at the expense of their right and obligation of self-government according to the will and laws of God. And that important fact is what I think elevates the understanding of the founders to a point that ought to be a big warning for us. You see, because at the end of the day, if you wait until tyranny is upon you, if you wait until you hear the door clanging shut of the prison house and the chains clacking shut of the actual ornaments of tyranny around your physical body, it is way too late. We're approaching that point as a people. And I think we need to take the foresight of our founders seriously and look for the signs of tyranny with our mind so that our children can avoid ever living in a country where they will be painfully real. Now this is going to be the fastest group. We are standing right now in a place that I think is, is very symbolic of what is supposed to be the nature of American self-government. Uh, the Capitol is behind me. Uh, off to my right and in front of me is the Supreme Court. Uh, and the Supreme Court facing outward toward the other side uh, is obviously facing to in the direction uh, in which lies the White House. Uh, the seat, as it were, of the executive power where the President lives. The statue on top of the Capitol, as it is often pointed out, is turned away from the White House so that it exemplifies the fact that laws are given to the judicial power in order to be applied in light of the law so that action can be taken that is lawful, right? That's what makes actions lawful. What I think is hidden in this kind of allegorical or symbolic arrangement is something that you're reminded of if you've ever read uh, Montesquieu's work, which the founders did, uh, on things like the powers of government and the separation of powers. Why? Because Montesquieu makes it clear when he first discusses the powers of government that the judicial power is an aspect of executive power. In the nature of things, you cannot execute the law if you do not make a judgment right, that applies the law to a given situation. So every use of executive power requires a judgment. It's a judgment call. It has to be. <laughs> and therefore, the judiciary is an aspect of, ju of executive power. The uh, separation of powers between the executive and the judiciary is therefore, in a sense, one of the artifices, a thing done by art, because it's not done by nature. It's not in the nature of executive power for that separation to exist. It is done by art. Why? 
It's done by art in order to make sure that there is an added bulwark against tyranny. So we go from Jefferson, who is swearing eternal enmity against tyranny over the mind of man, to an arrangement that reminds us that the Constitution was put together in pursuit of the objective of making sure that tyranny would not occur. And that one of the vital resources in that is the separation of the judicial power. But what good is the separation of judicial power when, as Hamilton puts it in one of the Federalist Papers, the courts have neither force nor will because the president, the one we call the executive, is in command of all the forces. In other words, the one who can act, the one who can actually do anything is the president. And the will is in the Congress because they're the elected legislative body that represents the sovereign's will. For the sovereign is not the president, it's not the court, and it's not the Constitution, contrary to what some people want us to believe. The sovereign power is, in, is vested in the people of the United States who speak the words of the Constitution. And it is the sovereign who speaks the words that organize the government. It is the sovereign that chooses the ministers of the government as we choose, the president and the legislators. And, and so at the end of the day, that sovereign power is vested in a government in which the application of that sovereignty is, is separated from the judgment that is required to bring that application in line with the law. Why again is that? Because at the end of the day, the occasion for making that judgment ultimately becomes the people themselves in the actions that they take. We don't think about that. But if you separate the judiciary out, then when the executive makes a decision to apply a law to you, right, that decision is not final. That decision can be readily appealed <coughs> because the judgment that's involved can be all called into question in a court of law, in light of the law, in light of the Constitution, for a separate judgment to be made. And the initiative for calling it into question lies with the people themselves, with every individual who can then have recourse to the court and say that was not a lawful judgment. Yes? All of which points to an answer to the question that I raised uh, uh, in our, our discussions uh, before, and that is, who is the guardian of the Constitution? Well, the guardian of the Constitution is, has to be, at the end of the day, the one who is always the guardian, for it is in the use of the sovereign's power, wisely, prudently, or unwisely, and imprudently, that a given way of governing is either going to sustain itself or be overthrown. And, and, and this is not Alan Keyes talking only because Joseph Story in his famous uh, commentary on the Constitution of the United States, he ends the whole work with a paragraph that, that answers this question. He points to the fact that no form of government that's based on representation and election, no form can come into being or sustain itself without the character and faith and courage of the people. And that no f form of such government can be sustained unless the character, faith, and courage of the people are sustained. Because the people are the ultimate guardians of the Constitution. And how do we achieve this? Well, see, that's where I think we are now coming to our greatest test, perhaps, in the history of our country. Uh, right now, we are in the midst of a time, and everybody's acknowledging it. This is what is frustrating sometimes to me. You, you are hearing all over the place uh, people uh, saying that things are being done now uh, by our government that are lawless. These are lawless things. Things that acknowledge no law, that have no warrant in the laws made by our legislature, that have no warrant in the law of God and, and of uh, nature which God has ordained, and that are going contrary, therefore, to our basic rights and the basic premises on which this way of life is based. How are the people who are the guardians of the Constitution, which is supposed 
to be, along with the treaties and laws made pursuant thereto, the supreme law of the land. How are the people who are the guardians of the Constitution supposed to do their job? Well, in the first instance, they're supposed to do that job by taking account of the breaches of that supreme law in such a way that they form what the court does not have. See, as Hamilton rightly pointed out, doesn't have the force because that's in the hands of the executive and doesn't have the political will because that ultimately is in the hands of the people who are then supposed to shape the composition of the legislature to reflect that. And the founders then put in the hands of the legislature the power to take any presence. Why the president should never be regarded as king. Because the king couldn't be removed by the people. Just by saying so. But the president can be removed by the representatives of the people once the people have said so with sufficient will. Now you and I both know what that means, because we all know that sometimes when you have authority, you'll say things in a tone that says, well, you can have some leeway to think about that one. I'll get back to you if you're doing something I think is wrong. And then there are other times when you just make it absolutely clear. And there are other times when you say it's my way or the highway, and you're about to show them the highway. Well, the provisions for impeachment and removal are for those my way or the highway moments. When you're basically looking at people in government and saying, that's not what we put you in there. To have lawless government that ignores the laws, that ignores the Constitution, that ignores the rights of the people. But the founders also didn't want that kind of thing happening every day because it would mean an unstable government that in the end would lead to conflict and civil war. So light and transient causes, as they say in the Declaration, not good enough for this kind of a change. But if it's something intense enough to move people, then it will be intense enough to be reflected in a larger majority in the legislature. And so they set the bar high for impeachment and removal. Higher for removal, of course, because that's the ultimate sanction for abuse of official power to be deprived of it. Fairly low for accusation. And I thought, I think, uh, and they were right in this, that they thought that accusation should be used pretty frequently. Okay. That it's all right to bring up a bill of indictment that says, these are the things we say you're doing wrong, prove to us we're wrong. And we're living in a time right now when various things, whether you mention Benghazi, for instance, uh, whether you mention what's happened with Obamacare, what's happening with the immigration laws, Congress has been asking questions and the executive has been refusing to provide answers. Well, what's the only process where there is no basis in executive prerogative for refusing to answer the questions of the legislature? See, because the executive does have the ability to say, no, can't answer that question because that's executive privilege. If I answer that question, it's going to interfere with an ongoing effort that we're making that is required, and I can't tell you that. It's especially potent when they do it on national security grounds, isn't it? And so Benghazi would fall right in that category. So the president can extend the cloak of his executive privilege over anybody and tell the Congress, no, not going to let them talk to you, or we'll stand by while they don't talk to you. What can the Congress do? Well, the ultimate sanction is to impeach them. Impeachment means in the first instance, not remove, but accuse, indict, say you are doing something wrong. And what do they then have to do? They then have to come before the Congress in order to tell them what they're doing. And the Constitution says explicitly that the President has no power to pardon folks, no power to protect them, which he has otherwise in full range, when impeachment is involved. So if you really want the answers, or you really want to set it up so there'll be maximum pressure to give the answers, you have to impeach. But is the Congress going to impeach if the people aren't behind it? Of course not. And that at the end of the day is going to require what? An expression of the popular will at the polls. And that's what I think is missing, in a sense, that we must always keep in mind when we stand in this place, when we think about the legislature, think about the uh, powers of the Supreme Court. They want us to anymore. They, they want to almost to act as if these branches are somehow operating on a power source that has nothing to do with the people, and that's a lie. Right? The whole power of government is sourced 
in the will and strength of the people. That's the whole premise of our self-government. Okay? That consent that we give, that assent, that voluntary joining together creates the power of this government. And so we have to always keep in mind that nothing for good or ill is really going to take place in these institutions if we don't make it happen. If we become passive, if we refuse to play that role, not only will this form of government fail, but because we have created institutions that have a reputation of power over the course now of a couple of centuries, a period of dark and terrible abuses becomes possible. It's like the era when a good king dies and a bad one takes his place. The good reputation of the good king means that people will hesitate and they'll wait and they'll tolerate things that they oughtn't to because of the good king's reputation. Well, right now, we're in kind of that period and we need to awaken ourselves from it because if we don't, we're going to soon realize that the only power that this government can have when the people are not vigilant, is the power to abuse and destroy them. Uh, but if you go and do your research, you, you'll find that you count the actual victims of things like the Inquisition and the lynching in the thousands. Uh, and though the burden of slavery was an awful thing, I know from long study that you have to make a distinction between the slaveholder and the committer and perpetrator of these government-sponsored uh, atrocities. Why? Because the slaveholder, though we forget it, actually had an interest in keeping the slaves alive, healthy, and working. It was not in the interest of a slaveholder to extinguish his slaves. It was not in his interest that they should be brutalized and destroyed because that cost him or her money. It cost them profit. They even went so far, as I was reminding folks in a piece I wrote recently, to encourage family life among their, uh, the people they enslaved because the mores that are associated, the sense of responsibility and of love and commitment actually makes people more assiduous workers. You have to come to the 20th century in order on the kind of massive scale that put everything else in human history almost to shame to come upon eras when people by the tens of millions in numbers that we can barely even imagine in their magnitude would be put to death for the sake of eliminating them from the picture. Why did that happen? Uh, it would be easy enough to say that it happened because of uh, the fact that they didn't have a government that, like ours, was subject to the constraint of power. They didn't have a government of limited powers. And people talk about this all the time. Even people who call themselves conservative will say that the principle of our government is that we're a government of limited powers. But that's like Barack Obama campaigning for change. You have to ask yourself, change to what? And when somebody tells you and uses the slogan of government of limited powers, do you know what you have to ask them? Limited by what? Huh? Limited by what? Because if it's a government of limited powers that's limited by other powers, so that the only reason that they're not doing X, Y, or Z that's going to slaughter and destroy people is because some other power is opposing them that would then slaughter and destroy them, that may lead to a certain kind of equilibrium, but it's the equilibrium that prevails in an urban area where the territories have been marked out by the gangs and they agree in order to avoid mutual annihilation to respect some boundaries. Is that the kind of government we're supposed to have? It's the kind of government we're getting. We're moving into an era when that mentality will be the nature of limited government. The government by one gang or another, limited by the respect it has to have for the power of the other gang. Is that who we are? No, it's not. Because limited government from the very beginning in these United States meant government limited by what? 
by the purpose of government, which is to secure these rights, the unalienable rights that come to us from God. That is a government then limited by an understanding of right. An understanding of right that basically says, thus far you go and no farther. No matter what power you have, no matter what wealth you have, no matter what technological ability you have, the mere fact that you can do something doesn't give you any authority to do it in contravention of right. But where is the real constraint that that involves? We all know where it is. These days, more and more people want to act as if this is not true. But the only constraint that's actually going to make that form of government effective is the constraint that is in the heart and in the spirit and in the mind that is submissive to the understanding of right that applies to all people in all circumstances at all times because it comes from the supreme ruler of all. And that was the understanding the country was founded on. It's why, by the way, back in the 50s, I know, oh, everybody, we, we live in an era that is most characterized by how arrogantly we despise everybody who came before us. It doesn't matter what they did. Every generation is tainted, and we're the only generation who knows anything, and therefore, we're better than everybody else. And yet I go back and look, and whether it's the founding generation or even the generation that fought communism, one thing they understand, when was God, in God we trust put on our coins, for instance? When was under God added to the pledge? It was in the era when we were fighting the communists and when people understood that what distinguished our government from their government was not power, was not weapons, was not bombs, was not strength. It was our reverence for the understanding that every form of power must be limited by respect for the authority of God. And so everywhere they wanted to reiterate our understanding that the true source of our liberty is not in the power we have, but in the powerful God who gave us an understanding of right that allows us to live with respect for one another and to empower a government that will respect all of us. Uh, and so I think that as we stand before this monument, well, I guess you could only think of the terrible cost in human lives. But I think you can also think of how you can avoid that terrible cost. And, and though the scientific materialist ideologies that so many people subscribe to believe that you must fight power with power and evil with evil, this country was based on an understanding that if you were willing to accept the discipline of respecting the right as God gives us to understand the right, then you could find within yourself the faith and the prudence and the courage and the understanding to fight evil with good, to fight evil for the sake of good and therefore to offer a result that would not just be the devastation of war somehow held at bay, but the realization of justice, realized and offered with its blessings, not just to those who live amongst us, but in our example, to people who live around the world. And I think that that was part of the reason why we were able to make head in that period of time when we fought what was inherently an internationalist ideology. We forget that too, don't we? We're faced with another one now, though they don't like to talk about it, in uh, fanatical Islam. But Americans weren't faced by that. Because we understood that though our first order of business was to provide an example of a nation in which people could breathe free because freedom would be used for right. Yet we also knew the power of that example and were willing to stand with others moved by that power in order to introduce more and more of the world to the ideas and concepts that we stand for. I, I know some conservatives, I call myself a conservative, uh, believe that, that we ought to withdraw from the world, but the founders never did. And Reagan never did. And none of the people I admire throughout our history ever did. 
whether as the city on a hill or as a people engaged with other peoples because we have drawn from every corner of the world folks who have followed the beacon light of that righteous liberty we offer. Do you realize that? Just as we send representatives to a legislature. So in every region and in every country and in every part of the globe, people have sent representatives to these United States. And we stand now together trying to make this experiment in liberty work as it's supposed to. And as we do, we cannot forget who we are. I once said it in a speech I gave at the United Nations, which is worth uh, thought worth remembering, that one of the reasons we get so involved with the world as Americans is because we come from every place in the world. We are Asians, Africans, and Europeans. We are blacks and whites. We are Italians and Irish. We are Jewish and Christian and Hindu. We are of all different backgrounds. We are truly a nation of nations in touch with the people of all the world. But the truest representation of that, which we offer to the world, is our acknowledgement that there is a standard of right and justice that applies to all. And that it is our striving to apply to everyone who is willing to come and stand with us in the effort to implement that standard for the people who live in the United States. It is above all by our example that we defeat and have defeated those who do not understand that concept of right. And if we have the character and the courage and the will to continue it, then I think this nation will stand as George Washington did to his generation, an example of the character that helps to make all people free. We're standing here in Lafayette Park, right across from the White House. And this whole environment is a reminder of a great many things. I'm standing in front of a banner that depicts the family of Teddy Roosevelt, uh, a Republican president, uh, even a president who would have been called, I guess, in his era, a progressive Republican. But in case you confuse him with any of the progressives of our time, I want to assure you that one of the things that has always struck me as outstanding about Teddy Roosevelt is his sense drawn, I believe, from a right understanding of the founders. That sense that this country requires that its people maintain a strong sense of the character, the good character that is required in order to sustain self-government. A character that he believed was going to be based on self-discipline, and courage, the willingness of individuals to take on the challenges of their own lives, uh, which he did in the course of his life. He, he was somebody, and I had a sympathy with this, because in his early years he had respiratory problems and other things that were supposed to inhibit him. And he actually gave himself a routine that was so rigorous that by the time he was uh, uh, shot at in an assassination attempt, the muscles that he had developed from his routine of running and exercise and hard work were so uh, well built up that the doctor said that that muscle acted exactly like a suit of armor and saved his life. He would have been killed except the muscle slowed the bullet down and kept the damage from being as great. He was also somebody who understood the importance of family life and understood that nations, in fact, are going to be built or destroyed depending on the character of their family life and of the individuals produced by that life. It's one of the reasons, by the way, that though he was somebody who understood the great importance of immigration in American life, he gave on several occasions speeches in which he made it perfectly clear that we should never as a nation look upon immigrants as what he calls factors of production but instead should see every immigrant as someone who wants to come and join in the American experiment. And that if they are not willing to do that and are just coming uh, in order to get some kind of economic advantage or be exploited in some economic way, that that was against the American idea and the American ideal. And finally, in this understanding of the importance of the individual and family, I think he was living out and trying to perpetuate 
an understanding that was clear in the minds of the founders. That understanding that I shared a moment ago that at the end of the day, it is the people who are the guardians of the Constitution. It is the people who are the guardians of their liberty. No government, no army, no armed force can substitute for it. And I think it's, it's a, interesting that we are standing here in the midst of of Lafayette Park, because uh, Lafayette, as you know, was somebody who was famous for helping to whip Americans into shape during the time of the Revolutionary War. But the Americans he was whipping into shape were people who were already conscious of the discipline uh, that they had obtained as part of an organized militia that helped to defend their families and homes, and that had been, as you know, critical uh, to the first critical moments of the American Revolution, in which people came together in order to make a clear point about uh, their rights, but also their willingness to stand in defense of those rights. And what is the backbone of that militia concept which is in the Constitution of the United States? The backbone of it is the backbone of the organization of the community. It is the tradition of family life, of building strong, cohesive individuals who are willing to stand in defense of their homes, which of course people had to do on the frontiers without the recourse to armies and so forth. But when they did it in communities, they knew that they were the first line of defense. And that even where organized armed forces would help to deal with an enemy, the first hours of an enemy's attack had to be dealt with by the people themselves. And cognizant of that responsibility, they had, as Roosevelt knew, to keep themselves in physical shape in order to meet the rigors of uh, that war would require. They had to keep themselves in shape in terms of their conscience, because bad conscience leads to bad morale. And a sense that you are not worth fighting for uh, give, saps your will to fight for yourself as well as your family. So all of these things come together. And they come together at a moment when, sadly, I think, we are being misled by many of the people in our government to turn away from the bedrock importance of that, that family life. A family life that is critical, not just in economic terms. People think about it and talk about it sometimes in that way, and I, I agree with it. As a matter of fact, the word economics comes from a Greek compound word that means the management of the household. And it therefore refers in the first instance to people living in their families. But the other thing about family life that I think is critical to what we are and would, I hope, be able to remain as Americans is that it raises up people who from the earliest moments of their lives understand the sense in which they are in fact the focus and center of God's attention. That they are, even though just one among many, yet there is a love focused upon them that is like the love that uh, might be lavished upon kings and potentates. And that is the love that comes from their parents and that comes from hearts that understand how parents must uh, be in the place of God, especially in terms of that loving care which helps the child to be raised up in the way uh, that they should go. And I think one of the things that is the worst sign of the future we're preparing for ourselves is the willingness either to accept economic policies that undermine and destroy that family life, or to accept an understanding of marriage and the family that detracts from the central function of family life, which is the rearing of children and the provision for future generations in a society's life. Making that provision in a way that will keep alive the strong sense of individuality, of individual worth, but also of individual responsibility and of the voluntary willingness of individuals to take on responsibility for one another's care, which parents at their best exemplify to their children so that they can in turn exemplify it to their children and to society as a whole. These things are not things, by the way, that we're going to be able to reproduce once we have destroyed our respect for that family unit. And I think one of the reasons this society is bankrupting itself is because we have let sociologists and social scientists and bureaucrats talk us into believing that there is some way we can buy with money what money cannot buy. Money can't buy the kind of selfless attention and service that true parents give to their children. Many cannot unlock that secret of the heart which God knows how to unlock the moment that your child is born into the world.
Parents will do things that you will never get by paying people with money. No social services, no trained caregiver will ever be able to look upon a child with that unique look that a parent gives to their children, knowing that in some sense they are, as it were, looking in a mirror at their very selves, but also at a mirror of something that they know is more important than themselves, which is the union of love that produced that child in the first place. And that sense that love can produce such wonders is, I think, one of the things that is the greatest gift of family life. It's why procreation is one of the crowning glories of our humanity, and our consciousness of it makes us better human beings. But it also will assure that our society is a society that can rely upon us to do for the common good what we learn to do for one another's good in the family. Have you ever noticed how many things in life, business enterprises, public enterprises, all depend on people using the language of family? That we will unite, that we shall be a band of brothers, that we shall act as it were, as a family. Even the people who act as if the government can play that role must speak of it in terms of family life. If we do not keep alive the true God-endowed paradigm of the family, then those words will become empty and our society will be emptied of the real and blessed results, which alone produce the bedrock foundation of all societies, but especially societies composed of those who would be free. God bless you. We are standing in front of and across the street from a museum that commemorates what will undoubtedly be the overshadowing memory of a century that is filled with memories likely to overshadow the nightmares of humanity for some time to come. And that's the Holocaust Museum. A museum devoted to making sure that folks do not neglect the Holocaust that was perpetrated against uh, Jewish folks and others during the course of the Nazi era. Uh, it's one of those places that you, of course, wish there was no need for it and that it had never existed because you wish that the evils involved in it had never been perpetrated. But it is an occasion not only to remember but also to reflect on what, in fact, made those evils possible. And the sad truth is that the Holocaust Memorial, like the Victims of Communism Memorial we were at, simply exemplifies a part of what was in many ways the most enormously costly century in terms of man's inhumanity to man in the history of the world. There have been all kinds of slaughters and atrocities in human history. Some of them earth-shaking and civilization undoing. But I think repeated atrocity involving hundreds of millions of people when you add, them, add it all up in the space of a hundred years, most of whom were not the victims. Because people often forget when I say that, I am not counting the direct victims of World War I and World War II. Not the victims of the wars. These are the victims of mostly government-sponsored Holocaust that took the lives of people who were uh, doing no harm at the time, except that they were citizens who had somehow run afoul of the prejudiced powers of their government. But I think they had also run afoul of what happens when you lose sight of the fundamental premise that the founders of America were thoughtful enough to make the keystone of America's existence. And that is the premise that there is a God and we are not Him. That there are powers that we may develop in technology, industry, nuclear power, you name it. But that those powers will never, ever allow us to claim the authority of that supreme power, which not only has the ability to destroy, but has the unique and otherwise unparalleled uh, ability to create from nothing a universe of his own understanding. 
the reverence of America's founders for the existence of God in that understanding, and a God, therefore, who determines right and wrong, who has carefully delineated the presence of each and every human being in terms of their person, in terms of their background, in terms of the species as a whole, and the ways in which they are to be respected. That presence then acts as uh, a constraint, if not on the abuse of government power, then on the ability of abusers to claim that they somehow have the right, the authority, the justification to do what they are doing. I think sometimes we forget how important that is. That human beings, generally speaking, you can get a few human beings to act in a psychotic way, doing things just in order to exemplify their own power, no matter how evil they think it is. But you don't get masses of people to act in that way. I was always impressed, and one of the things that impressed me was when I went to visit in the Holocaust Museum, they had at that time an exhibit that had, among other things, uh, a exhibit where part of it was uh, Goebbels, I think it was, was making a visit to the uh, concentration camp. And they had a dinner, and he gave a speech to all of the people who were on the staff and, and, and servicing the concentration camp. And he made no bones in his speech about the fact that what they were doing must be trying to their conscience, must be a challenge to their emotions. But he told them that this was strength, that they were showing strength, and what they were doing was for the sake of their, of their, uh, of the Volk and of their, of their fatherland, and that they were in fact heroes because they were willing to endure what they were enduring and harden their hearts so that they could achieve this purpose. I'll never forget it because it's a prime example of the fact that the greatest evil must nonetheless pose as some kind of good. Otherwise, at the end of the day, you won't get large numbers of human beings to join in the perpetration of that evil. What is the barrier? What keeps people from accepting that? I think the only barrier can be a sense that there is a standard that transcends the feelings, that transcends the moment, that transcends the fervor, that transcends whatever may be the praise and glory that we lavish upon any human individual, any human nation, any human power. And as, in the course of the development of Christianity, a living sense of the truth of that power became part of the warp and woof of certain societies and culture and humanity, it starts to build in an immunity to the kind of fanaticism that can lead to the extermination of peoples. The interesting thing is, if you go back into the ancient world, because some folks seem to believe that, oh, if we only were to turn the clock back to pristine sunlit days of paganism, I don't know where they get this. Oh, because the pagan religions, you might read about them in Plato and all of this and think that they were all sunny. But the truth is, they were groves of death. And they unleashed in the ancient world routine atrocities. It was understood that you didn't have to pay much account to people who refused to accept your gods and whose gods you had defeated. And also that sometimes, depending on the threat you thought they posed, uh, you would, as the Romans did to Carthage, get tired of beating up on them over the course of generations, and when you finally took them over, you not only destroyed the cities and enslaved the women and children and killed all the men, you salted the earth so that nothing would ever be able to grow where there had once been a great city. The difference between the 20th century and those ancient eras of atrocity lies only in the magnitude of the atrocities. Hitler actually drew on that same wild spirit of paganism, which at the end of the day so reverences its own idol that nothing else has worth. No other human form has valuable being, and it can be torn down and destroyed at the whim of the idol that you worship. The only true antidote to that kind of idolatry is not to be beaten by another greater and more powerful idolatry. It is to be beaten in the hearts and minds of people who understand that there is no power that can justify a, a violating a standard that abuses the standard of God's right and God's truth. And, and the fact that the United States was founded on that standard, I think, accounted for a lot of the good things that happened in American history. 
including those things that were triumphs over what had been long-standing evils, that finally fell in the face of convictions that were born of the faith reflected in the Declaration and of the sense of obligation that individuals had to, co to make their actions correspond to that understanding of God's will. In that sense, I have to tell you that uh, people may get all upset and say that this isn't a Christian country and all, and I always agree. It's not a country that's only for Christians, but it's certainly a country that would never have and could not now continue to exist once Christianity has been abandoned. For Christianity translates the respect for God into a personal responsibility, which you acquire through Jesus Christ in a way that gives you the wherewithal to acquit yourself of that responsibility, because his heart is in you, and his will is in you, and his mind is in you. So that ordinary folks like Mary could sing in the Magnificat that he has taken the lowly and lifted them up so that they can shame the great. And isn't that the story of American life? It is the story of what folks have done in this country as a nation, and it is also the story of what, as individuals, we have been able to do if we accept the responsibility that goes along with those wonderful beliefs we claim we cherish, but we only cherish them truly when we put them into action in a way that respects God's justice toward ourselves, toward our children, and toward those who share a community of commitment to his righteousness with us. Uh, and that's why I think the, the keystone of the success of American life is now and will ever be that understanding that there is a God, we are not him, and that the rights with which he has endowed every human being represent a standard of right that no power on earth has the right to ignore. I think if, if that had prevailed in the minds of Germans, you know, they were very sophisticated people, the Germans. They boasted some of the greatest philosophers and scientific minds that came along in the 19th, early 20th century. And yet, when an incarnation of evil spoke to the heart of their anger and their resentment and their pride, he was able to take all that intellectual discipline and toss it away into nothing while they plunged the world into war and sought the utter extermination of a people that he made the object of their hate. The power, therefore, of that kind of force in the absence of that willingness to accept the authority of God has been demonstrated clearly. And I think we need to start worrying now as Americans because as we turn our back on God, as we move away from the concept of God-endowed unalienable right toward all this materialism, this preoccupation with money and power that is destroying our country, we prepare the way for atrocity. And the atrocities of the 21st century will be far worse than the 20th. In the 20th century, as in all the eras of humankind, we abused the people that God had made. But in the 21st century, we would get nearer and nearer to the kind of knowledge that will allow us to create, or think we are creating, beings that we will then tailor so that they may be oppressed. And the end result will be not just that we oppress them, but that we utterly abandon and destroy the humanity in ourselves. I think that for all their talk of ecological disaster, this is the way the human race will truly extinguish itself once we have let go of the truths that made us free. The fundamental truth that we are creations of God and that in the use of the powers that he gives us to sustain ourselves, we must respect the right that he has made part of our heart, part of our conscience, and I think in the American context, part of the justice that is supposed to guide our nation's life. We're standing in front of the Iwo Jima Memorial, which is probably the best known uh, throughout the world of the memorials uh, that came about in this country as a result of World War II. It is a memorial not only, I think, to the uh, country and to its spirit in World War II, uh, it's especially also 
I think, a memorial to the spirit of the American people and a pain to the simple truth that this country came to represent, which is the triumph of ordinary people in the most extraordinary possible circumstance, proving that a people touched as America had been in its founding and thereafter by the Spirit of God was capable of getting through the worst kind of adversity in a way that then made a huge difference to people across the face of the earth. And that it was particularly appropriate because we exemplify people who came from all different parts of the earth. Uh, as the statue is known to do, uh, exemplifying people of various backgrounds, making their contribution as individual soldiers, some of them in ways that were highly improbable in terms of the moment captured uh, in this wonderful memorial. It reminds us also, though, of what World War II itself was. In some ways, I think it could be referred, unhappily at the moment, it could be referred to as the last American crusade. And by crusade, I mean the last time that our people united in a spirit that fully understood our vocation in the world, uh, took a role in the events that were taking place in the world that explicitly answered the calling of that vocation. The history and background of the war such that it also exemplifies what I think is a good thing about the American people. Some people may think it otherwise, but in all the participation in the wars that we had up to the Second World War, our participation as a people was reluctant. Americans didn't want to go to war. And that is because we were then, and I think we still are, not a warlike people. It's hard to be a warlike people when you know so many good things to do with peace. And it's part of what I love about America. That people have come from America to America from all over the world in order to build a nation in which people know exactly what you should be doing when peace breaks out. And they don't sit about the way people had to sit about a lot of them who were the distinguished types in the Roman world and so forth, wondering when the next war or the next conquest would happen. This is also a reminder that all that tremendous exertion in the course of the Second World War, I know that there were people, some of them friends of mine and people who bore a conservative label and so forth, who were fond of speaking in the course of uh, the Reagan and years and thereafter, as if America had some empire or some stake in empire. And I always found it annoying. Because in point of fact, the people who participated in, in World War II, Korea, even Vietnam, they did not go to war any more than the people in the Civil War did for the sake of some empire-building scheme. They did not lay down their lives for the sake of that. And if you turn back the clock to World War II in particular, what do you find? The war breaking out, were breaking upon a reluctant people who once they realized the evil that they were dealing with, did not hesitate to answer the call. But it was not a call to rule, and it was not a call to power. It was a call to help to do justice in a world where those were triumphing who had no commitment to justice as we understood it, and who in fact were diametrically opposed to it. That call was answered by people to a degree unheard of before, both in our history and I think in the world's history so that we were able to claw back from a position at the beginning of the war where one had every reason to believe that in our military posture we were primed for defeat in order to pull off that miracle which is required and was required in modern warfare at the time that the whole people be engaged in turning the country into an arsenal that would provide both the, ourselves and all our allies with the wherewithal to defeat what was seen not just as the enemy of the United States, but as the enemy of liberty, as the enemy of freedom, and especially as the enemy of rights throughout the world. War like this begins and ends with prayer, with the invocation of God's help, and the strong sense throughout its conduct that we were a people who sent our men and women into the fray, uh, not at the the behest of our masters, but at the behest of our Lord. Uh, and that sense, I think, not only sustained our country in the course of the Second World War, 
it also helped to inform the expectations we had after the war ended. And I want to say something here. Some people will think is uncharacteristic of me because I'm not known as a big fan of the United Nations. I spent time there. I served there as an ambassador. Uh, and the, what, what has become of the United Nations, I think, is a serious disappointment to me. But I often tell people that I surely don't blame the generation that founded the United Nations. Because they came out of the Second World War having learned the right lesson. Having learned the lesson that if the world was to avoid such calamities, then some effort had to be made to establish a cooperation among the nations of the earth that would be somewhat like the cooperation we are striving and still strive, I hope, to achieve among all the peoples who represent those nations here in the United States. There was a serious and deep commitment that I think actually had salutary effects throughout the world, encouraging people to think in terms of self-government, to begin to understand the challenge of, that, of adapting that self-government to their countries and their ideas and their ways of life in areas around the world. And I take great pride in being part of a nation that made that attempt and that along the way resisted temptations of power that no other nation in the history of the earth has ever resisted. <clears throat> Sometimes it's good to think not just about what happened, but about what didn't happen and about what would have happened in the case of any other nation. We stood at the end of World War II, the only really viable power remaining on the face of the planet. Everyone else was in a position where if we did not come to their aid, the most powerful nations in the world would never rise again in power. What do you think? Some of the great conquering nations would have done with that. And I sometimes even think maybe if Winston Churchill had been in our position, not entirely clear to me he would have resisted the temptations of empire. Now for all the lies people tell about the United States, we did not establish an empire. Nobody, even our enemies, had our boot on their neck when the generation ended that followed World War II. And many countries that had been in the hands of colonial masters found their independence and claimed their liberty because we pushed for that result through the mechanisms that have been created in the United Nations. Why are we? Why were we such a people? Because we were founded on premises that had a meaning and significance, not just for our country, not just for its power, but for all humanity and for the dignity and the rights and the justice that all human beings are entitled to. And we said so. And we did so. And when I say we did so, I mean we didn't do what others would have done. Napoleon used to say that if he had had thunderbolts, he would have used thunderbolts in war, right? Imagine a nation standing at the end of a terrible and devastating war with a military might at that time unparalleled and holding in its hand a monopoly on the thunderbolt. Having demonstrated the effectiveness of that thunderbolt in order to bring that war to an end. And imagine for a moment what we could have done. Not only with our erstwhile enemies, but with those who had thought they were our allies and could have been made our vassals. You would expect that a generation afterwards you would have seen a Japan still prostrate. You would have seen a Europe entirely dependent on us. Instead, what did you see? By the time you get into the 60s and the 70s, you are looking at our former enemies, Japan and Germany, competing the heck out of us in all kinds of economic activities. And you are looking at people who might have been our vassal states instead coming together in a great European Union, never before heard of, in the hope that peace would be sustained on the European continent in a way that had to challenge our economic and military supremacy. Because our people didn't think of it in those terms. Now, I sometimes remember reading the accounts of uh, the proposal that was made in, uh, after the uh, atomic bomb and the discussions that took place. You do realize that at one point we were seriously considering creating a UN-like institution tribunal and turning over all our nuclear weapons to that tribunal. 
I, I, I used to wake up in the morning and thank God we didn't do that. Oh, because I'm not entirely sure how the whole business would have turned out if we had. Uh, but the fact that we thought of it gives you a sense of the mindset of our leaders at the time. And I think verifies that the sacrifices that were made by the men and the women who represented us in World War II were not in vain. They were not for economic greed. They actually fought against evil, but more importantly, for the sake of an understanding of justice that had meaning for all the world and that we helped to mean something for people everywhere. And final point, I think it's important to remember the way in which our faith informed the courage and spirit with which Americans approached that battle. Didn't have to argue in those days about whether chaplains were going to be kept with the units or whether there was a role for prayer, because when you're in the midst of real war, you, you know that there's a role for prayer. And everybody doesn't mind at all, just in case, seeking the prayer and the help from the Lord, because you never know, and even the avowed atheists will sit and listen patiently while you call upon the Lord they may soon be meeting. Uh, and that spirit of faith also helped to guide the our use of the consequences of the war. Uh, and I can never come to this memorial, because my father was a soldier, he fought in World War II, fought in Vietnam and Korea. I grew up on military bases and in a sense with an understanding of military life from the inside out. But I also grew up in a context in which I was led to understand that the real reasons why uh, people went to war and fought and even came to understand and cherish the sacrifices they had to make. And I think it's part of what guided me to um, a role in public life that I have tried to play. That understanding that the only way, as Lincoln said, that we can make sure that these dead have not died in vain, that those who sacrificed heart and sometimes hardened consciences in order to win victories for a country they deeply believed was in the right, is never to give them cause to think that they are wrong. So that if their spirits still dwell in the universe, as I believe they do, and God can share with them some knowledge of the outcome of the sacrifices they made, our lives will prove that they made the right decision. And that though it seemed they gave up all, yet they also gave all to generations yet to come. And it always renews my determination to do the same for people in the future. And we'll be talking about that when we visit the Lincoln Memorial, because I think at the end of the day, do you know what people do when they sacrifice themselves in war? They bear witness. They give the most vital and the deepest witness. They give the witness that is recognized in Scripture as an immediate ticket to the favor of God, so long as it is a witness to His justice and His right. And I pray God that we will always have leaders, as I sadly think we don't right now, who will never engage us in a battle where our soldiers do not die on battlefields, where the sacrifice of their blood joins that blood to the blood of the Savior, so that it may be lifted up to the Lord our God for His merciful forgiveness for our nation, for our people, and for the world. God bless you. We're here at the Lincoln Memorial. It's, it's probably of all the places in Washington. It's the one that has a great deal of meaning for me in various ways. In my life, I used to work right across there at the State Department, not far from here. So sometimes when we were in the midst of things that were particularly trying, this was one of the places I would come to walk around and think. Uh, and it's a wonderful place to do that, especially if you're working on something you think is important for the country. Uh, but I want to talk for a minute here, though, about what I think was the fundamental importance of Lincoln in a way that parallels what I believe we have stand in great need of in America today. Because the Civil War was the coming of that test which the founders had anticipated. What 
pretty much all of them thought would at some point, in some way, uh, come about on account of the existence in the United States of an institution that was fundamentally incompatible with the great principles on which the country had been founded. America founded in a declaration that declared unalienable rights that come from the hand of God for all human beings. The institution of slavery founded upon the systematic denial of those rights uh, to people on a basis that was characterized as race and so forth, but that really just involved uh, putting greed above the premise of uh, the unalienable rights of all human beings. And indeed built a way of life on that premise, which though it had some similarities to the great republics of ancient times, uh, was in fact entirely inconsistent with the premise of the great modern republic that the founders uh, sought to build in America. They knew that there was therefore the seed of a fatal contradiction. That in some sense, as Lincoln would later say, of the crisis that came to a head before the Civil War, the United States was a house divided against itself. Uh, in which, on geographic grounds, on grounds of economic organization, a fundamental incompatibility between the idea of a nation that recognized the rights of all human beings as they came from the hand of God, and a nation that built at least partly its economic prosperity and wealth on the denial of those rights uh, to a significant group of, of human beings. Uh, and I think that sometimes, Though people want to act now, and some of the great revisionist historians want to pretend that the Civil War was fought on economic grounds, and that's all that mattered. Uh, and they can, if they like, come up with all kinds of uh, analyses that might support their view. The one thing that decisively refutes it, however, is the letters and the speeches and the thinking that characterized the people themselves. I think it's one reason that Lincoln has gone down in history uh, with the affection that he has, because people are not only affectionate to a man who represented the survival of the nation through that terrible travail which could have marked the extinction uh, of the United States as it was originally founded, but I think he also articulated what was on the heart of the people in the midst of that great travail, because he acknowledged the truth that we are finding it harder and harder to acknowledge today. But it's impossible, I believe, to go into this monument and this uh, great effort to remember what Lincoln was about without being reminded of what I think were his two most important contributions in terms of rhetoric to uh, the understanding that America had of itself, the Gettysburg Address and the Second Inaugural. And it's in the Second Inaugural in particular that I think Lincoln was willing to do what very often uh, our leaders these days pretend there is no need to do or no right to do. Uh, this great crisis which involved the nation in the most serious war that the American people would ever engage in. And we still uh, sometimes forget that World War II, all of them, they didn't account for as many actual deaths as the Civil War. Uh, and so the sacrifice, when you think of the relative proportion of population, is enormous uh, in terms of what people gave uh, on both sides to the understanding of justice for which they fought. But it was to Lincoln that it fell to reconcile that terrible conflict with the purpose of the American founding. And he did so in a way that was not only an evocation of the Declaration of Independence, but that added to our understanding of that declaration in a way uh, that allowed the Union to re-emerge on the other side of that great civil conflict uh, with an understanding of America's vocation in the world that I think then fueled our rise to international stature and uh, ultimate uh, greatness in the 20th century. Uh, because it was Lincoln who confirmed that it was not a parochial contest that it was in fact a great contest testing a fundamental premise of justice for all human beings and that that contest was brought about not by accident, not by just greed or economic circumstance, but as he said and implied in the second inaugural, it had come about because of a judgment of God. 
And you'll probably remember the famous words that he uses in that speech when, when he says that if all of the wealth piled up by the bondman's 400 years of unrequited toil must be spent. And every drop of blood drawn with the lash must be requited by a drop drawn with the sword. And as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. It's startling to me sometimes that we live in an era when our people and a lot of our leaders want to pretend that there's some possible way to understand our history and our heritage without reference to God, and then make note of the fact that the man who brought us through the Civil War's great travail was able to start the process of healing the nation's wounds as he conceived of it by evoking that contest as a judgment from God which then meant that every soldier fallen on the battlefields of the Civil War fell as a witness, as a witness to that great judgment of God, and therefore in the literal sense fell as a martyr in the cause of finally healing that breach of justice which stood in the way of America's fulfillment of its better destiny, not just for the American people but for all the people who subsequently would be attracted to these shores as the great waves of immigration fulfilled that promise which the founders had insisted on giving when the nation was founded. One of the first things that struck me years ago when I was studying the founding period for part of my dissertation work was that when the country was founded, there came a point in their argument with Great Britain where all of the founders adopted a change in language. They had started out discussing the rights of Englishmen, and they ended up discussing the rights of man. They had started out in a parochial dispute with the King of England over what prerogatives they ought to have as his subject. They had ended up adopting all of humanity as their cause and believing that they would found a nation that was going to prove once and for all that all the philosophers and all of the people who had, who had said that a people could not govern itself, that ordinary folks would not be able to make a go of a great nation, were wrong. And on behalf of all humanity, they would vindicate the capacity of humankind for self-government. There is no doubt that in the years since that founding, we have done so, but there was one great moment of doubt. And in that great moment of doubt, Lincoln appealed to and shaped the conscience of our nation to understand that it was not a conflict that was just about our human things and our human feelings and emotions. It was a conflict that was about our willingness to stand responsible before God for the realization of that principle which had given this whole people the right to claim the authority to rule itself. An authority that came not from human power, but from the just hand of Almighty God. I think we need to pause here and think for a minute about the implications for the future of our country now. Because I think we're as near to disintegrating as a nation as we have ever been except for the Civil War. And that disintegration promises to take place. And there are nations in the world have already written their articles. The Russians are fond of writing these about how we're going to break apart and what the states will look like and so forth and so on. What is going to keep us from that breakup? Well, I think the only way we're going to avoid it is if we remember the true principle of the Union. And the true principle of the Union turned out to be not a geographic principle, no, it turned out not to be an economic principle. The Civil War was not about economics, it was not about isms. The Civil War turned out to be about America's crisis of self-identity. And whether that which identified us as a united people was in fact going to be affirmed once and for all, rather than contradicted in the way we led our lives. Uh, and I think we can be, as Lincoln certainly was, cognizant of the great debt that we owe to all those who fell in those terrible battles. I spent part of my life, especially living in this area, visiting some of those battlefields and imagining what they were like. Uh, and I can tell you what, you, what you really put yourself in the place of the soldiers who fought in that war, you realize that fighting those battles required a very special kind of personal commitment. The commitment that the meat would have to have going into the meat grinder if it could in fact be conscious of its fate. What would lead you to do it anyway? 
what led many of them to do it anyway was their firm belief that two premises of the American way of life had to be respected. The first was the premise of equal rights coming from the hand of God for all human beings based on His standard of justice, not our own. And the other was the premise of self-government. That government could not dictate to those that it governed that which was contrary to their conscience. I think some people forget that the latter was the reason uh, a man of character like Robert E. Lee ended up fighting on the southern side in the Civil War. It was because he believed that a principle was at stake. He was no believer in slavery. And what we can thank Lincoln for is that at the end of the day, he took the great principle of God endowed right and he married it to the principle of government of the people, by the people, and for the people so that we stand now on the ground that vindicate in the name of God the right of ordinary people to shape the destiny of their extraordinary nation. And yet we now fight over that very premise. Because there are people who seem to believe that we can forget what the great statesmen who founded the country remembered. We can forget what the great statesmen who healed and preserved the Union remembered. And that we somehow are going to be able to perpetuate the great hope this nation represents while forgetting the great authority of God to which this nation has throughout its history appealed in order to find the common ground on which we stand. Uh, I think as we see this and as we remember it in the terms that great statesmen like Lincoln did, we still have a hope of getting through our own crisis of America's identity in a way that will affirm the truth that nothing about our technology refutes the simple and wise premises on which it is based. And that if we can remember that, that all the promise that is offered, not just to us, but to mankind, by the leaps forward that human beings have made in their knowledge of the world, will be preserved in justice because we remember the simple premises of that knowledge handed down to us for generation that comes in the end from Almighty God. That as we stand before Him, we are equal in our capacity to do what is right with respect to His justice and toward one another. I think that's the affirmation that in the end will save us. And one final thing, the willingness to stand for it no matter what. I think that's going to require, though we may not realize it yet, a degree of sacrifice equal to the sacrifice of those who waded through fields of blood during the Civil War. We may not be called to give our physical lives, but we will be called to risk our, our livelihoods. We will be called to risk our comfort. We will be called to stand forward to ridicule and even to the detriment of many of the ambitions that we may have in our lives so that we can vindicate the simple truth that without God there is no freedom, without faith there is no liberty. And we will not let go of God because we will not let go of them. We're standing in front of the Vietnam Memorial. Um, I think it's a fitting place to bring our meditations, as it were, today uh, up into our own present in order to confront not so much the inspiration that I believe is true in our past uh, as the challenge we face in keeping that spirit alive for future generations. What has always intrigued me about the Vietnam Memorial Wall is not perhaps uh, all the controversy that surrounded its original proposal and design uh, and what I think has been the heartfelt embrace of people in the subsequent years, but also what it exemplified about the quandary that the Vietnam War uh, typified, but that has now become, I think, the overall condition of our country. Uh, Vietnam was the first war in which the memorial does not remember so much the cause as the people who fought uh, for the sake of it. In our past wars, by the way, that had been one and the same. Because in one sense, that is what happens when people bear the ultimate witness. They 
are individuals and they are remembered as individuals, but their memory never dies because the cause for which they die lives on in the hearts of people so that their memories are cherished for the sake of what they made possible. But in order for that to happen, the cause has to be understood. And there has to be a singleness of heart amongst our people in terms of that cause. I call the Second World War our last crusade in that sense because I think it was the last time the American people stood on that simple, singular, common ground. The last time when top to bottom our leaders understood and our nation both acknowledged and fervently felt that what we did, we did for the sake of truth and that that truth was not just affirmed in the blood of our slain, it was affirmed in the will of Almighty God. There has been, during and since the Vietnam War, no such consensus uh, in the American nation. Now, I have to be honest with you. I don't think that's because the American people have as yet changed in some <laughs> fundamental way as people would like us to believe. I think it's because, for the first time in our history, we are dealing with an elite that is no longer committed to the American idea. We are dealing with people who have been through law schools and medical schools and training schools and education schools in which they learn premises diametrically opposed to the premise of justice on which the nation is founded. The people still yearn in their hearts to be remembered in terms of the cause that allows them to govern themselves, that makes their liberty a precious commodity. But the elites have redefined the world in such a way that not only has that cause disappeared, but humanity itself is threatened with extinction as we are subsumed under the label of what can be understood in scientific and material terms, in which our spirit disappears, in which our heart no longer matters, in which all that we are is a transient moment, lived and then gone. But you have to pause and remember that if that is in fact all there is, then the sacrifices that have been made on battlefields far flung by Americans were sacrifices made by those who did not understand the futility of their death. Because for those deaths to mean what they are supposed to mean, there must be a right, and there must be a truth, and there must be a cause that endures beyond their death and endures beyond the sacrifice of life because the spirit for which they die the truth for which they die can never perish. This was the promise on which the nation was founded. It was the premise on which people fought and died to bring it into existence. And in every war, in every battle, in every political struggle in our nation's existence, it had been what informed the heart and spirit and sense of justice of our people. In this day and age, we have allowed a politics to develop that demeans the sacrifice as it demeans the nature of our people and of the human race in general. That wants us to believe that our, we're squabbling over money and goods and that there is nothing more to this life than what we can buy and sell or feel in our momentary pleasures. You don't win many recruits to go and give up the life that they save for others if the idea of life for which they die is one that ends when their blood is mingled with the ground. But if life includes hope, if life includes an understanding of justice, if life includes the vindication of the spirit that can be carried like a light from one generation to another, then those who die pass on that light. And we can keep it alive as we keep them alive in our hearts as God keeps them alive in his memory. And I think that that is the reason why we were able to get through all the great and burdensome wars and that the lie was put to those who had said in the past that the folks who, who drove the plow, the folks who picked up the garbage, the folks who farmed the fields, the folks who did the laundry, the folks who worked in the drugstore in the supermarket behind the cash register, they were not the noble ones. They did not have what it took to do what the knights of old had done, to do what the warriors had done, who wrote their names in letters large across the pages of history. We proved them wrong. 
We prove that in the hearts of all the ordinary men and women, all the regular folks the philosophers had despised, there was the greatness that could live the nation beyond the hope of any nation that had existed in the history of the world and sustained the hope of all the people who had come from all the different parts of the world to make real the promise of that vindication of their spirit and their soul and their capacity for every human being on the planet. And I think we're engaged now in a struggle as to whether we shall let that spirit die, surrender to materialist ideologies that reduce our nation and ourselves to nothing but the dust from which we are made. Dust we are, they say, and to dust they have already returned us. But I think that America was founded in order to prove that whether we were born high or low in the esteem of the world, yet the Spirit of God stirs the dust from which each of us is made. And therefore we can reach a height that is only limited, not by the power of man, but by the power of God. I think that's what finally drove this nation to stand where it did for a brief moment, striding like a colossus across that page of history that was written down beneath the banner of our liberty. I don't know that we shall ever stride the world in quite that way again, and I'm not sure we should care, for it was never our vocation to be great. It was our vocation to be just. It was our vocation to be decent. It was our vocation to offer to ordinary people the extraordinary possibility that history had denied to them of a place where justice would be accorded them and where the achievements of their country would be acknowledged as their own. And that is not a vocation that dies with some transient moment of greatness. As long as there are people, as long as there are folks hoping for the best for their children, as long as there are generations willing to live in hopes for the best for all humanity. America will have its destiny and will contribute to the fulfillment of humanity's destiny in the unique way that God intended. So in that sense, for all the confusion of our present times, I think if we do not give up on God, he will not give up on us. If we do not let go of his truth, his truth will sustain us again. And we will find ourselves coming together as we did once before at the end of a period of great confusion, affirming that we are one nation, affirming after all is said and done that our union has prevailed. But this time it will not be a union of states, it will not be a geographic whole that we make, it will not even be a political union. It will be a union of heart and of spirit and of hope that will extend not just to us and to our progeny, but to a world that we have made better by the example of what we have done in this place, in building this nation of nations, in building this people of peoples, in building this hope that speaks to the hope on God's heart for all humanity. Thank you. Hey, hey. Bravo.